as you expose yourself to the things that you're afraid of, your fears will subside and that this exposure is in some cases necessary to get the full effect of that fear reduction. So if there's a skill that you're trying to work on that gives you anxiety, like, you know, you're you're working on cold calling or you're working on, you know, asking someone out on a date or you're trying to ask for a raise from your boss, these are all anxiety provoking skills to practice. And so exposure, I think, is one of the most powerful tools that we have for reducing that amount of fear. All right. Welcome to the show, Scott. Great to have you. Yeah, it's great to be here. I know for Johnny and myself, we love learning new things. Part of the reason why we started the coaching company and the podcast was to learn from people like yourself. And I know you have a passion for learning. So Mm -hmm. why don't we just jump in? And if our audience wants to get better at something, how should they do it? Yeah. So I think the most important three things that you can do to get better at things is first study from the people who are the best at it. So figure out how the skill you're learning actually works. Then you got to do practice, do a lot of practice to get good at things. And finally, you need to get feedback. You need to learn from the environment or from other people what you're doing wrong and what you can change about your performance. So that's the basics. But of course, there's a lot of details (laughs) that we can get into about how to do those right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know for some of us, we see others do things effortlessly. It feels like it comes yeah. naturally to them. And we might feel some reticence to try to learn from someone who just naturally is gifted yeah. in that one skill. So how do we pick the right people to learn from? Yeah. Well, one of the things I would start off saying is that I think sometimes people often make the mistake of assuming that someone who is really good, it's really effortless, that it's just natural talent, that there's no amount of practice or work that went into it. And I think, you know, the the classic example of this is if you think about like driving your car, if you've been driving your car for decades, it's pretty automatic. You just, you know, move your hands, you move your change gears when you need to. You can even listen to an audio book. Maybe you're listening to this podcast right now while you're driving and you can just do it effortlessly. But was it like that when you first started driving? No, of course not. It was very effortful. And so this is one of the real lessons of the academic research on learning is this transition of skills to becoming more automatic, more effortless. And so when you see someone that's really, really good at something, I think there's this natural tendency to say, oh, well, they're just really good at it. There's nothing I could do to be that good at it. But very often it's the case that in some form or another, they have gotten a lot of practice. They've gotten a lot of feedback. Maybe they themselves have seen people, mentors, role models, people who have shown them the right way to do things. And they've just practiced it so that they don't have to think about it. And so if you're first learning something, yeah, of course, it's going to be more difficult. But having the right mental model or mindset, I think, really makes a difference there. And how has that impacted your life? So looking at all the great lessons and things that you've learned yeah. quickly and assimilated, you know, how have you taken that approach to learning from others first? Yeah, I mean, well, for so many of the subjects we learn in school, books and actual teachers are like the obvious way that we read that. Like if I want to learn about personal finance, I don't need to like find that one rich guy that, you know, is a friend of a friend. I can just like pick up books and learn from the best people of the world, even if I don't know them. But for so many of the skills that we want to learn in life, uh, either there aren't books or they're kind of hard to learn from books. I mean, you know, the old saying, like, you're not going to be a tennis pro by reading books about tennis. (laughs) And so similarly, if you're trying to learn things like public speaking, or you're trying to learn things like uh, making sales calls or negotiating at your interview for your job, those are all skills that I think finding people who are good at it and seeing what they do. What did you actually do when you went to go buy that car and you had to negotiate with the the dealer? Those are the starting points because that gets you in the right ballpark. I mean, it's not the same as saying you're going to be really, really good at it yourself, but it gives you that sort of framework for, for narrowing in. And so for me, I've had just this enormous benefit of role models and mentors. I mean, when I was writing my first book, Cal Newport, he was the guy who was like, okay, here's what you're going to want to do, this, 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 and this. I mean, how many people get that opportunity? And I'm very grateful for it. I think Johnny and I have been blessed and and or cursed by (laughs) interviewing lots of academics on this show and recognizing that there's a lot of theory. Johnny and I have an Mm -hmm. inside joke around clients who've read all the books amassed all of the knowledge <laughs> yeah. they possibly can about a subject, but haven't actually applied it in any way, shape, or form. And there is that pursuit of, well, reading, consuming, understanding things at a theoretical level is certainly yeah. impactful. But as you said, it, it doesn't help you when you walk into the used car dealership and now you got to put all these frameworks <laughs> into action with that guy selling yeah. you a car. Yeah. 
Well, I think part of it is just that the academic world of theories and ideas is often at some remove from practical work. Like even just think about the disciplines themselves. Like a theoretical physicist knows the sort of building blocks of like how motion and energy and things work better than probably anyone. But if you asked him, oh, my car is making a funny noise, what should I do about it? He would also be like, well, I don't know. You know, because the actual skill of fixing the car is a few steps removed intellectually from the theoretical domain. And so I think sometimes we can get in this idea of really, you know, embracing or fetishizing maybe some of these abstract theoretical ideas, but our real hiccups are just the mundane things that the academician skips over. So, you know, for instance, if like we're talking about you know, uh, investing your money, for instance, you might get this really good investing theory and, okay, I believe it and that's how I'm going to put my money. But then when you're actually making the decision yourself, the thing you get tripped up over is like, how do I open an account with the bank, you know? And that's the reason you don't do it because you don't know how to do it. And you're like, how do I buy stocks? What are all these, you know, different buttons mean? And like, you know, what's a limit order and this kind of stuff. And so, I think when we're trying to learn practical skills, I think one of the right things to focus on is that it's just a different kind of knowledge. It's a different kinds of things that you have to learn from observation that are often quite specific. They're not real high-minded general theories, but like these little nitty-gritty details, and that's what trips us up. Just to go along with that, like everything online, it's conducive to the philosophical, hypothetical discussions, yeah. and we can discuss these things all day and and people love to participate but when it comes to getting dirty not so much and so i've certainly i've had my fair share of friends who would love to discuss diet and gym routines but but they will never <laughs> go to that gym <laughs> but they can tell you everything that you yeah. need to do and everything that they are going to need to do to to get fit but except yeah <laughs> the actual work actual working and out, you yeah. can cut yeah and you can cut through all that as well i mean there was a to go along with that very topic there was a trend it's like we can discuss these things all we want but if you're not going to post your physique i'm not going to listen to you <laughs> because that is going to show that you're willing yeah. to put your efforts where your mouth is well and i think you know, to go back to what we were talking about, the difference between the physicist and the car mechanic, I mean, the thing is, is that the amount of theoretical knowledge you need, like, you know, you, the guy you're talking about who doesn't go to the gym, but knows, you know, all the details about like, you know, how much of the different amino acid profiles you need in your protein shake in order to maximize muscular hypertrophy, like these people who are in that end of the camp, but that they don't actually work out that much, or they're pretty in inconsistent about it. They have a lot of knowledge of that one type. But on the other end, there is the kind of, you know, you can have not that much knowledge, you can have just like enough, right? And if you've implemented it, if you've gotten those basics, you've gotten a lot of those details, you can do quite well. I mean, I don't expect my car mechanic to be able to like spout off, you know, Newton's three laws of motion or explain what relativity is. He doesn't need to know any of that stuff, right? He needs to know how the car works and like mechanically, you know, what's going on and why it's maybe making certain sounds, but that's somewhat at a remove from the theoretical knowledge. So I think the, the, the main thing to decide is what your goal is. What are you trying to accomplish? I mean, if you're trying to become an academic and publish papers, then you're going to have a very different goal than someone who's trying to get in shape. Well, going along with that C, I think there's a, a lot of internal value we feel by watching other people do it. And we're like, mm -hmm. okay, a few more reps and then I'll finally pick it up. But there's always that yeah. like starting point of actually going from seeing to practicing and doing. And how do we get over the hump for those of us who are feeling a lot of excuse making and, and maybe even some fear or anxiety around getting started in the first place? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about like to continue the theme of sort of these self-improvement oriented topics, I think one of the main things that you want to do is deliberately start with much, much more basic, simpler stuff than you're probably reading about. So to use the gym example, I mean, it's okay to read about these things. It's okay to read these books and get inspired and be like, oh, this is an idea to like, you know, squirrel away somewhere if maybe I get to the point where I need it. But you need to be behaviorally much more simple. So you need to be just like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, work out for 30 minutes a day, or I'm going to go to the gym three times a week. And I'm going to stick to that. And when I go to the gym, I'm just going to do these workouts and I'm not going to do anything fancy because 
that's dealing with the behavioral problem. And so I think similarly, when we're consuming advice, you can have a kind of almost like a different sort of balance sheet. You're like, if all the ideas that you're thinking about, you're mulling over, and then you just pick like one of those and you focus on it for like a month or two if you're trying to make changes in your behavior. I think that there can be skills that are quite complicated, quite intellectually sophisticated, where there is a little bit more of a parity of relationship. Like if you're learning to program a computer, for instance, you need to like see a lot of examples in order to even figure out how to do it. But for things where the locus of difficulty is like, it's because it's, you know, unpleasant, or it requires you to invest time or energy, or maybe there's some fear involved, uh, simpler is probably better. Yeah, I think for a lot of us that applies to learning languages, you know, trying mm -hmm. to seek out being bilingual, trilingual, of course, we can read all about the various conjugations yeah. and the verb <laughs> usage. Yeah. But ultimately, mm -hmm. we want to be conversational. So starting yeah. around conversational things first and, and yeah. understanding the basics of the language is going to get you a lot further than memorizing charts around conjugation. Yeah. And I mean, you can look at the conjugation chart and that takes about 10 seconds, but to have it internalized where you can produce it fluently, you maybe have to practice it hundreds or maybe even thousands of times. So there's a real asymmetry there of the amount of effort that needs to be placed in practicing. I mean, I don't want to overgeneralize that. That's not true in all cases. There are some ideas that if like you learn them once and you just get them and you just apply them, but certainly for things that need to be incorporated in habit or incorporated in skills that need to be performed fluently, the bulk of the work is in practice. Yeah. Looking at the, the next step of practice, I feel mm -hmm. we've heard 10,000 hours to mastery yeah. and we've all felt the, the pangs of frustration when we feel that we've plateaued. So it can mm -hmm. often feel challenging to blast through that plateau to get to mastery. And then sometimes you'll hear 10,000 hours. And you're like, there's no way I'm going to have 10,000 hours to dedicate to something like this. So the, the reason that we plateau, I mean, there's a lot of reasons we plateau, but one of the major reasons that we plateau is that when you continue to practice something, it get, becomes more automatic, more effortless, like we were talking about that, you know, as I drive my car, the sort of subroutines in my brain that govern driving just become easier and easier. Some of them get shifted into my unconscious. I rely more on memory rather than on reasoning. All of these shifts that happen psychologically mean that I can perform the same skill with less effort. Now, one of the disadvantages of that is that as I continue to do this over time, the skill in some ways becomes a little bit harder to introspect on. It's harder for me to think about like my hand position when I'm driving because I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about you know driving and where I'm going. Whereas when you're starting out, you're very cognizant of where you're positioning your hands. And so if it turns out that the way you're using the skill is suboptimal in some ways, it can be very difficult to do it the right way because you've overlearn to such a to such a high degree this somewhat inefficient way of doing it you know my classic example of that is people who learn to type on a keyboard by hunting and pecking you can get very automatic and efficient hunting and pecking but it's never going to be as fast as touch typing so this is one of the reasons why you want to learn kind of the best method in the beginning or at least close to the best method if you're going to be practicing something a lot but even if you do you're still going to have to do some deliberate practice where you're kind of very much focusing on the skill itself and not just your goal in performing the skill so you can improve why you got to call out Johnny's typing technique in the show <laughs> Yeah, well, you can. <laughs> one can be quite efficient yeah. in uh, however you are, <laughs> but it can easily be broken with a Mavis speak and typing instruction. Yeah, um, I mean the thing too, right. and <laughs> like I'm, I'm picking on, I'm picking on the hunting and pecking typist here, which there's probably some listeners who are like, yeah, that's how I type. And the truth is, it doesn't matter. I mean, if for a lot of people, typing extremely fast is not dimension of performance they care that much about. So like going to all the work to like learn to touch type, I don't know, is it going to really save them a lot of time? For me, I'm a writer and I spend most of my working days typing on a computer. So it, it actually does benefit me. But if you're not doing that and you can just click it fairly easily and now they even have like autocomplete so you can get you can get away <laughs> with only typing the first few letters of a word if you're okay with it being wrong about 10% of the time. So I mean, you know, is it really something you want to invest in? That's a decision you have to make. And I think that's one of the big things about self-improvement or getting better at anything in general is that you have to be focused in what you want to improve because you can't do deliberate practice on everything. You can't master every skill. So you just have to accept some of these things. I'm going to plateau at whatever ability I have. And then other ones, I'm going to focus on getting really, really good at them.
Well, you made a point earlier that I love to unpack because I went through this myself sure. with golf, and that's unlearning. So mm -hmm. I told my dad growing up I wanted to learn how to golf, and we had an uncle who loved golf. So my dad got me a set of clubs, said, go hang out with your uncle. And my uncle started teaching me how to golf, what worked for him. And I remember I didn't really pick it up at a great degree, but I was good enough to hack around a course. And then I hung out with some friends who actually played golf as co in college and played golf in high school. And mm -hmm. I was all excited to get on the course with them. And they're looking at me like, what is this swing? Where did you learn these <laughs> mechanics? And I realized yeah. that almost everything I was doing was wrong from the impact of a golf club to a golf ball to mm -hmm. how I was standing, the stance, everything. And I had to unlearn these bad habits and these skills that were taught to me by someone who wasn't probably of great effect at teaching people golf. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unlearning is, you know, kind of the corollary of what we were talking about before that, you know, as you become the really, really efficient hunting and pecking typist, then switching over to the touch typing can be difficult. Now, I think it's interesting that like theoretically, there's some debate about whether we can actually unlearn anything that really what you're doing when you learn that proper golf swing is you're learning like a completely new skill. And that completely new skill has to compete with the effortlessness and automaticity of the way your uncle taught you how to swing the club all those years ago. And so that's the difficulty. And in the book that I, I, I wrote about this, uh, talking about Tiger Woods, his big thing was that, well, he was golfing a lot. So that swing that he had mastered had really become ingrained. So to switch your swing in a major way in the middle of your career, I mean, this is something that Tiger pulled off, but many other golfers cannot simply because under the high pressure stakes of a, you know, major <laughs> golf tournament, the chance that, you know, you're going to revert to an old movement pattern is very high. And so there, there's a real risk in doing that, I think, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it does feel like it is competing in, in my head even now when I think about unlearning that skill and, and mm -hmm. the visual cues and the physical cues I have to focus on to actually fire the new skill that I've learned the mm -hmm. correct way and correct form to use the club. Definitely, definitely. So what I love about the book is there's 12 maxims. I'd love to walk through a few of your favorites and then maybe some counterintuitive sure. ones for our audience members who, who might be doing things the wrong way when it comes to learning something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think part of the benefit of, you know, for me reading a lot of this research and, and trying to put it in this book is that there's a lot of ideas about learning. So everyone has these sort of folk notions that, you know, they picked up from school. As soon as you pick them up from popular media and you don't even realize that, you know, serious researchers doubt them. You know, I, I was reading a textbook and they repeated the same learning styles theory that, you know, that there's kinesthetic, visual and auditory learners. And this was like an academic textbook and they were talking about how important this is. And I'm like, nope, they didn't read the research that, you know, actually people who study this say that, no, that's probably not true. And so I think getting a grounding of like, well, what actually works is very important because otherwise you're just sort of sifting through the kind of slurry of popular advice. So a few of the ideas that I found really helpful in my own understanding of this is one of them is the idea that uh, retrieval often beats review when you're practicing a skill. So if you want to remember something, you strengthen memory more by trying to remember it than by looking at it again. And so if you're trying to give a speech or or, or do something where you have to memorize something, practicing it with your notes covered is much more efficient. You're going to memorize it much faster doing it that way than if you are looking at your notes the entire time when you're practicing or rehearsing your speech. Another one that I think is also very valuable, which you know people maybe appreciate to some extent, but it's not always a unified message in the popular discourse, is the idea that as you expose yourself to the things that you're afraid of, your fears will subside, and that this exposure is in some cases necessary to get the full effect of that fear reduction. So if there's a skill that you're trying to work on that gives you anxiety, like, you know, you're, you're working on cold calling or you're working on, you know, asking someone out on a date or you're trying to ask for a raise from your boss, these are all anxiety provoking skills to practice. And so exposure, I think, is one of the most powerful tools that we have for reducing that amount of fear. I don't know if you want to get into any of those specific points or jump to something new. Yeah, well, we definitely do that in, in our courses. <laughs> and I think it's yeah. a big part of recognizing that there's degrees of exposure. And you, you talk about flight mm -hmm. simulators and their impact with pilots. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. piloting a plane, ton of risk involved and <laughs> very expensive equipment. So mm -hmm. when we're trying to train pilots, it makes a lot of sense that we'll put them in a simulator environment where there's no danger, no harm, but also where 
they don't maybe don't have access to all of the controls, but they can start to learn the most important controls at the start. Very similar to what we do in our boot camp, where we break down conversation into parts, practice it with peers and team members and partners, get some feedback on it, improve in the classroom, and then go out in the real environment and watch it in action. So that controlled environment and getting some opportunity to get exposed to something in a, to a lesser degree than being up in the air piloting a yeah. multi-million dollar plane is super helpful for learning. I mean, it, the thing that fascinated me from the research is that the research shows that at the beginning, flight simulators are actually more effective than flying a plane, which I think is kind of counterintuitive. Most people would think, well, yeah, you'd be, you'd be better off learning in the actual plane. It's just you don't have access to it or it's too expensive or it's too dangerous. But no, actually, people learn faster when they have more ground simulator hours in the beginning, and then it switches so that you get more benefit from flying the actual plane. And I think the reason for this is that in the beginning, simplification is often a virtue that you performing a skill in a simplified environment, then the real thing actually improves performance because you learn the fundamental principles. One of the studies I really liked that showed this was that they had uh, people flying in a simulator and there were two settings. One of them was just normal wind conditions. The other one was a crosswind condition. And the interesting thing was that the people who flew in the normal wind condition did better in the crosswinds condition in the actual test than those who first learned under crosswinds, which seems counterintuitive, like how could that be? But it's probably because in the crosswinds condition, the controls don't behave the way you think they should. And so it's easier for you to figure out what the controls are actually doing in the simpler condition and then add the layer of crosswinds on top than to start with the more complicated scenario. So in some cases, you know, if you're learning to do public speaking, for instance, you go to a Toastmasters meeting, it is a little bit, you know, hokey and like people applaud for even your bad speech and this kind of thing. But in some ways that gives you, okay, I can understand these basics of public speaking in this very friendly, no risk environment so that, you know, when I'm giving a TED talk or I have to go give a sales pitch to a VC who's, you know, tired and doesn't want to listen to what I have to say, I'm going to hold it together and actually perform in that situation. Yeah, under stress and tension to great degree makes it very difficult for you to do the basics if you've never done them mm -hmm. before, or you've never practiced them. So lowering that temperature around the tension and pressure, but allowing you to focus to a degree on the basics then creates the opportunity when you are faced with that tension and pressure to default back to that basic training. So that crosswinds example makes perfect sense. It's like, oh, well, I know how the plane's supposed to be flying regularly yeah. in calm conditions. Oh, wow, now it's doing some things I haven't felt before, but I know what it should be doing. So very quickly, you can assess and start to improve. Yeah, I, I think about this example, and I don't know who said it, so you can't uh, get the source for this one, but <laughs> there was this guy who was a, like a martial arts instructor, and he was saying, oh, my students always tell me, well, when I actually get in a real fight, like I will rise to the cage, you know, when the mugger comes or this kind of thing, that's when I, my, my skills, the adrenaline will really come out. And he said, no, it's the complete opposite. You fall down to your worst level of practice when you're in the real situation, that like you practice it and you have it perfectly in the gym, and then you're going to be like, you know, fall down to that level. You're not going to rise up to some new level of fighting ability that you've unseen of just because you're in the real situation. And I think there's some truth to that, that often the things that we can perform flawlessly in the simplified condition are harder in real life. But that isn't a reason not to do it in the simplified condition. It's just to point out that practicing it in that sort of uh, basic zone is, is very important in order to build those fundamental skills. Yeah, I know, you know, we've had on athletes to the show and even late into their career, they're they're practicing in the gym. They're they're mm -hmm. practicing with the stadium empty. They're they're practicing not in front of a crowd, but they're still working on the general mechanics and tons and tons of reps, even though they're mm -hmm. professionals and they're at the top of their game. Yeah, I mean, some of that is also related to your attitude. I think that, you know, we were talking about before, you have to be very selective in choosing what you're going to get good at, because obviously, you don't have time and energy to get good at everything. But there's a kind of flip side of that, which is that a lot of people don't really strive to become really good at anything. And I think that's also kind of sad. You know, if you see people who are top performers in their field, they are not just satisfied with their performance. They're like, you know, I'm good enough at this, I don't need to work on it anymore they really focus on like, okay, I'm going to go back to those basics and get even a little bit better. And clearly in athletics, which is such a competitive domain where, you know, one-tenth of a second or just being slightly faster can make the edge, 
But I think even in our professional lives, whether you're, you know, a writer or whether you're a lawyer or a doctor or something like this, performing at a high level of skill is something that is also a choice. It's something that you have to dedicate yourself to. And a lot of people don't. And I think that's also partly a factor of why some people really excel over the long term in, in certain fields. And what are some maxims that might be surprising to our audience or counterintuitive based on some of the things we're taught by the media or by yeah. our families? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's lots. So I, I think one that I, I liked uh, is the idea that if you want to have sort of broad and flexible skills, doing variable practice, so practicing in different situations is better than a lot of repetition. And this is somewhat surprising because I think most of us have this idea that practice involves doing the same thing over and over and over again. So, you know, the person who's working on their tennis shot stands in the court and they just like hit forehand serves for like an hour. And that's like how they're getting good at it. But the research actually shows that this lack of variability, this very narrowly controlled practice conditions is actually not so good for the efficiency of the practice. So if you were trying to get better at, let's say, your forehand and your backhand, you're much better off if you mix up the shots than if you try to do them like all forehand and then all backhand. And similarly, if you are introducing elements of variability in, in you know, like we're talking about language learning, you're practicing conjugations. How do you learn it? Well, you learn the, you know, present tense conjugation first certain verb ending and then you do the workbook that has like 15 of the same thing in a row. And the truth is, is that while this can be useful in the very beginning for like getting the idea, like if you don't understand what you're supposed to be doing, then it is easier to do it this way. For the bulk of practice, which is mostly what you're doing when you're trying to become fluent at something, mixing it up is actually more efficient. So that's one of the ones that I thought was interesting. Another one uh, we could talk about is the, the mind not being a muscle. That's another one that constantly I have debates about people because the research is pretty clear, but people seem to disagree with it. <laughs> Where did that one come from? Do you, do you know anything about the origination? Because I feel like that caught fire, yeah. that the mind is a muscle and we just got to keep flexing it. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell a little story. So I had a little like uh, debate with someone after the book came out and he was arguing that, you know, well, you know what, this, I, I disliked this chapter because we now have all this information about neuronal plasticity. So like, this is the idea that the brain can rewire itself and that there's changes that happen in the brain with training and practice. And I said, that's true, you know, but that still has nothing to do with the original point. So the idea, I'll explain what the idea is and I'll explain why we think it's false, <laughs> is that originally the way people thought the mind worked is that it was similar to a muscle. So if, if I think about going to the gym and I lift a lot of heavy weights with my biceps, I should expect that those muscles are going to be strong for you know carrying groceries, lifting things, all sort of general purpose things that involve my biceps. And there's only so many muscles in the body. So if you just train all of them in the gym, you're going to be generally strong for most things. Now, even this has a few like wrinkles of truth in, in actual practice because the nervous system is involved with lifting things. But the muscle idea, I think, is very potent. And so there was all these educational and training ideas of the idea that like, well, you want to strengthen in your memory. And you'll see that. There's people saying, okay, well, you need to be doing these brain training games to improve your memory or pr prove your reasoning or your critical thinking. And th as, I, as I discussed, there's a lot of evidence showing that that's not how it works. That when you practice Sudoku puzzles, you get good at Sudoku puzzles. You become faster at doing Sudoku puzzles. And maybe there's a little bit of benefit from like other puzzles that are similar to Sudoku because they actually have overlapping procedures or knowledge. But it's not the case that you just, just generally get better at all sorts of puzzles. And it's certainly not the case that like, oh, doing a lot of Sudoku puzzles, that's strengthen my mind for, you know, stock picking or something that's like really far afield. And so this sort of idea, this muscle analogy, I think part of the reason it's tempting is any kind of tempting analogy, it's tempting because there's some grain of truth in it. And that grain of truth is that when you practice, you do get good at the things you practice. And there is this sort of penumbra of other skills that get a little bit of benefit because they overlap in some of these basic procedures. But I think we tend to exaggerate how big that zone of transfer actually is, this transfer from one skill to another. And so I think the the better model of of how the mind actually works, and and I think that more fits the data we have, is that you can think of the mind as a collection of tools. So it's a toolbox that you have lots and lots of tools, and as you acquire new tools, you put it in the toolbox, and as you practice and you figure out which tool you should use in which scenario, you practice it. But it's this collection of tools rather than you know a few muscles that you just strengthen through some kind of bulk practice that really matters. So if you want to be 
generally smart about lots of things, you need to learn lots of things. If you want to be a critical thinker in lots of domains, you need to know about lots of domains. You need to practice lots of critical thinking methods. And so I think this is something that, you know, maybe it's a little disappointing to people, which is why it's not as popular. Learning style series is another one that people love because it's uh, gives some sort of optimistic view of things. But I think having the right picture is really important because, yeah, if you're like, oh, I'm doing all these crossword puzzles every day because I got to strengthen my mind for the workplace or I want to stave off uh, dementia when I'm older. I, I just sort of like, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, I definitely feel like it, it feels good to think that way. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, you know, I'm doing this fun thing, but it has all these extra advantages. But as you point out, so few things in life are just static. You're never just going to yeah. take that one same jump shot over and over again. There's going to be variance between what's going on in the environment, who you're playing basketball against, maybe where you are on the court. So it's important to recognize that just because we're practicing this one thing over and over again, it doesn't extrapolate out to all these other skills that we need. Now, to be clear, I want to like just just take it back one notch from what I said earlier. There can be motivational reasons that learning one thing helps you with another thing. So you know, we talked about language learning. Learning my first language was the hardest because I'd never done anything like it before and I wasn't sure whether I could do it. But learning like the fourth or fifth, it just becomes routine at that point. And it's not because the knowledge is the same. I mean, obviously, if you're learning like French and then you go to Spanish or something, but actually some of the words will be similar. But if you're dealing with like French and then you go to Mandarin Chinese, there's probably almost no transfer of the actual language knowledge. But what is transferred is that you have maybe some strategies for learning languages and maybe you have some confidence in yourself for doing that. So building confidence, building self-efficacy can be very important. And so I definitely don't want that to be the takeaway is like, well, there's no point in learning things because Scott said nothing transfers and this kind of thing. But rather, if you're going to do a lot of practice in something, realize that there's going to be a specificity to that practice. You know, if you are really practicing some particular kind of activity, the benefits are going to be concentrated around that activity. So if you were doing it for some other purpose, that can sometimes be counterproductive. For a lot of folks, having an understanding of how they learn, because Mm -hmm. we are all different, we all learn differently, there's all ways that we learn that are more appealing to each other, and it's about figuring that out. And for a lot of folks, let's say that learning or having to learn a new skill is novel to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, They got a new job, they have to learn a new skill. If they're not familiar with that, learning process and how they learn, it can be very demoralizing. Yeah. And they need to understand how they gather information, how they apply information, how long it takes for them to go from unconscious incompetence to conscious competence. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, that there's a quite a, a process there. And as I mentioned, it's easy to get demoralized if you don't understand how you learned or have done it enough to where you understand uh, the routine that you need to get to a desired result. Yeah, I mean, the emotions that surround learning are often much bigger than the kind of intellectual difficulty of learning. I mean, things like confidence, like, I, you know, someone asked me this, because uh, I read quite a few books when I was reading this research, and they asked me, like, do you have like some kind of trick or, or like strategy you use for reading books and papers? Not that I'm like the best at it, but this was a question that I was asked. And I was just like, oh, well, no, you just like, you just have to sit down and just read them all. And, and that was like kind of disappointing, because he was expecting there to be some kind of gimmick that you use, because like him sitting down and reading, I guess, you know, it, like for a lot of people to sit and read like dry academic paper for like an hour like this is mentally strenuous but to me i feel like that's the that's the kind of switch that gets flipped is that like often you can do it not because the work has actually changed but just because your attitude has changed about it or the emotions around has changed so you know if i'm reading a book i don't automatically think oh my god this book is so boring i can't possibly get through it all i'm sort of like oh this is interesting and i have these questions in mind and hopefully i'm going to find an answer to those questions or, or maybe a new question that's related to that when i'm reading it and so it's very goal directed when i'm reading it, and and that allows me to get through it and so i think this sort of emotional rewiring is often a bigger factor than just having an actual skill like if you have the idea that oh yeah learning a language is not that bad you just speak to people and you practice it and you get more fluent at it and it's it's okay. I mean, that is the biggest hurdle, not learning the words and phrases and grammar. Like if you have crossed that hurdle, then I could just throw you in another country and yeah, in like six months you're going to be chatting with people. Whereas the other person who's taken, you know, high school Spanish for four years is going to be stammering when they go on a trip. Well, even so, with the, with the languages, I mean, 
I myself mm-hmm. have spent the last two uh, winters in Colombia. It's mm-hmm. the least English-speaking country in Latin America. But if I don't actively practice it, what what I will do is my body, my brain will actively look for ways to get the things that I need with the least amount of speaking yeah. because that's not where I'm strong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I've devised all these little ways of communication with people in order mm-hmm. to get the things that I need just to survive. I have to take time out of my day to actively practice those skills mm-hmm. and go out of my comfort zone and my little routines to then to try to acquire those things. And, and that's, that's where the, the fun is. And yeah, it's going to be frustrating because, yeah. well, you don't do it. <laughs> you know, what you're describing, I think, happens for a lot of skills where there's sort of the, the kind of easier option. And then there's the, the option that has yes. lower long term costs, but it's like in the moment, it's going to be more difficult. The example, this was sort of the insight, you know, since we're on the topic of language learning, this is sort of the insight that my friend and I had when we went and did, we did a project, this is now a decade ago, and I wrote about it in my first book, where we went to uh, four different countries. And when we were in each country, we decided we were only going to speak the language that they were speaking there. So we were in Spain, Brazil, China, and South Korea. And the you know, when I've discussed this project with people after this, they're kind of like, oh, that sounds crazy. Like, I would never do that. Like, I I would not go to a country and be like, I'm only going to speak Spanish. That would be too stressful. But the funny thing is, is that when you actually do it, the, the experience is often the opposite, that yes, it is very hard for like two weeks. But after you've been speaking to people in Spanish, which is often very bad Spanish, by the way, very bad Spanish for like two weeks straight, all the fear of doing that goes away. The automaticity of speaking in Spanish goes way up. So the the sort of per transaction cost of speaking in Spanish goes down to it's like, you know, maybe it's it's still harder than English, but it's at a level where, you know, you can you can do it and you can manage. And the result is that act, after a short period of time, you've done way more practice. And so you've expanded how much you've learned in that period of time. So that's one thing I would encourage people to think about when they're thinking about practicing a skill is how can I make tweaks in my environment or the standards I set for myself or my rules so that you know in, individually that maybe doesn't make any difference at all. Like deciding I'm not going to speak in any English doesn't make you better at Spanish. But if that causes this long-term change in how much I'm practicing, you might have like totally different trajectories that you have with the skills. So if you tell yourself, I'm only going to do this this way, like I'm only going to touch type now, I'm not going to hunt and peck ever, it's going to be really hard for those first few emails you have to compose. But then, you know, a week or two later, maybe you're actually going to be doing it faster. And so these are areas where I think looking at those leverage points where you can make a small change and have a big impact. Well, to go along with that, I'm an artist, I've been playing guitar my whole life. And even to this day, at 50 years old, I'm, if I'm learning some artist who I, I just love and appreciate, I have to learn their style, mm-hmm. the way that they have played it. And a lot of times, the way they play it is unorthodox because it's the way they've been playing yeah. it their whole entire life. So, But having an understanding of the rules and, and an ear for music, I might be able to cheat Mm-hmm. what I'm hearing through my hands to get the desired result. Now, it may not be exactly the way they played it mm-hmm. to get that result, yeah. but because I understand the rules, I'm able to recreate those same sounds, which brings us to the maxim that you have here of, of copying is your first way to get yeah. creative. Yeah, I think this is something that's really underrated because in Western culture in particular, and I think probably since like, you know, the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, there was this real philosophical shift to, you know, prior to that time period, not only in the West, but every other culture was like, you need to read the sages of old. They are the ones who have all the wisdom and no one knows anything today. And that's what you have to read and copy them blindly. And there was a real shift of belief of like, well, actually, should we be blindly copying people? We should think for ourselves and do experiments and stuff. And this led to science. And so in some cases, I think that's led to a little bit of an over extrapolation on this idea that, well, because science is particularly important at the frontier of knowledge, of creating new knowledge, of creating new reliable knowledge. Therefore, you know, we should be scientists in like grade one and like discover everything for ourselves and not have to study or learn from people who have learned it before. And 
one of the main things that I, I sort of took away from this is that, you know, that's just not how our brains work. That's not how we work as a species, that we are a cultural species, that almost everything we know, we didn't learn firsthand. We learned from someone else. Now, maybe we applied it and then we experienced the results and then we believed it for ourselves. So you can, you can do to actually believe it. But if we're talking about like how you learn to drive a car, someone showed you how to learn to drive the car. You didn't like figure out how to operate it through trial and error. And similarly, when you're learning many, many other skills, this ability to learn from examples is so important. And so copying it often is seen as this sort of antithesis of creativity, but really they're at the opposite ends of a spectrum of as you get more and more practice, you shift to creativity because you have such a library of examples in your head that you're able to freely remix it and repurpose it and use it in novel ways. So for you, you know, you've spent your life practicing the guitar, you've learned these different styles, you've copied from different people. So when it all gets amalgamated and you perform something, it is going to be uniquely you and no one's going to be calling you a plagiarist. But if I, who doesn't play the guitar before any time before, if I'm trying to learn the guitar and I'm like, oh, well, you know what? I like how you're doing it. I'm going to just like, I'm going to just freestyle it like this. I'm probably going to play in a lot of ways that are, you know, dissonant and don't sound very nice. <laughs> well, you, you touched on this important point that there's the skill building, there's the learning, there's the observing, but then there's also the emotions and the mindset mm -hmm. piece that go along with this. And sometimes our fear of failure or fear of rejection can get in the way of us even attempting to learn. And especially mm -hmm. in the beginning, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. So if you're afraid of failure, if you're a perfectionist, you're probably not even going to try to pick up the skill because you, you are going to fail many times over before you actually pick mm -hmm. it up. So for those in our audience who are a bit of a perfectionist, who have that strong fear of failure, how can we start to overcome that mindset to actually learn things quickly? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, we already talked about one of these ideas, this exposure idea that often when we're talking about perfectionism, we're really talking about a kind of anxiety, right? That there is some feared consequence of not performing perfectly or not being good at something or not being seen as competent. And that, you know, this sort of, threat detection circuitry we have in our brain, like centered on the amygdala is like beeping. It's like, oh, no, 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 there's danger here, danger, don't do this. And that is inhibiting our performance. So, you know, the language learning is a classic example. It's not just, am I not fluent enough with Spanish? It's just like, am I going to say something that's going to make me sound stupid? Or are they not going to understand me? Or am I, I, I can hear my accent. It's so bad when it's coming out. And they're going to be like, oh, this gringo, I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> you know, these, all of these sort of emotions are coming into play that are also inhibiting it, even if, you could say it perfectly, you know, in a, like if you wrote on an exam paper, you could write it perfectly. And so exposure is this idea that, well, sometimes those beliefs are unfounded, that there's a threat detection, but there's no actual threat, that you actually speak to the person in Spanish and nothing bad actually happens. And for things that we have a strong fear from, uh, particularly social fears, this is often the case that, you know, the worst thing you get is like, maybe it's mildly awkward for like a second or two, but you're not going to die, which is what like people are imagining that they're going to have happen. What's that, what's that joke from Jerry Seinfeld that, you know, the uh, people's number one fear, number two fear is death. Number one fear is public speaking. So people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. I mean, it's, it's the truth though, that like standing on stage and giving a speech, you're not going to die, but it often feels like something really traumatic is going to happen to you. Like you're jumping off of a building. And so by getting exposure, being in that scenario, then the fear will lessen. So that's one thing. I think the other thing that you can have that will help you with this idea of perfectionism is to shift your mindset too about what your expectations are. You know, to go back to that uh, language learning example that we were talking about, one of the things that my friend and I would do when we were starting to speak these languages very badly is we would memorize the phrase, I have a project to only speak, you know, whatever language for these three months. And if, as soon as you say that to people, all of a sudden your like, you know, halting attempts to speak their language switch from being like, how bad does this person think my English is? Or like, this is offensive to me to like, you know what, more foreigners should do this. You're doing a good thing. And the attitude totally shifts. And so I think ways that you can shift the sort of your mindset around what constitutes success and failure can be a big thing too. Because, you know, if you start writing an essay and your idea is I'm going to write this, you know, beautiful prose, that can be very inhibiting because you try to write sentences and they're not beautiful prose. If your idea is I'm going to get all of my ideas out in a stream of consciousness rant on the page, 
and then edit it later, well, now all of a sudden you've changed what the criteria are for the task. And so there's no inhibition. So I think that's one of the things that you can try to do when you're practicing is if you find yourself encountering that anxiety, that mental block, get yourself some exposure and get yourself a way to change how you frame the activity so that success is something that you can do. Yeah, I think managing the consequences of that failure helps tremendously. And mm -hmm. what we do in our classroom setting is we tell everyone at the start, we're all going to be making mistakes here. But we're going to have fun going through that process of making the mistakes. So, you know, they may have come to the class with the history of, of feeling, you know, poked at or, or criticized mm -hmm. by family members or teased in class when they made a mm -hmm. mistake. And they hone in on that mistake. It's like, oh, that's going to be a real negative consequence in my life. But then when you put them in a new environment with supportive people, much like your example while traveling by framing it as, hey, this is a project I'm working on, <laughs> lowered the consequence of you mispronouncing mm -hmm. something, misspeaking something. And all of a sudden you start seeking other ways that I can start to make some of these fumbles and mistakes early and get through them to pick it up faster. Yeah. I mean, I think there's lots of different tools that you can have, but I think once you encounter a skill, once you encounter something that you're learning, where you recognize that this is the barrier, I think it's often worthwhile to sort of take a step back and be like, okay, forget how do I become the best in the world at this skill and focus on how do I get through my own psychological blocks? Because, you know, as I said, if you are uh, Tiger Woods and you're working on your golf stroke, then yeah, someone who's like a, you know, kinematics expert is going to be like looking at your swing and be, but if you're the kind of person who's like, you know what, my problem is that I'm not good at this because I never do any practice. Well, then you need to shift the conversation you have with yourself to like, well, how do I actually get sufficient practice so that, you know, being methodical and perfectionistic and all of these things actually might have a place rather than, you know, I'm going to just focus on that. Even though I'm not doing anything, I'm going to focus on doing it perfectly. I'd love to delve into the feedback portion. I know for many of us in our audience, we're thinking about how to give feedback to others, whether we're managing yeah. people or we're parents and we want our kids to learn the skill of mastery so they can apply it in, in various areas of their life. So how should we be thinking about feedback upon seeking it and giving it? Yeah. So I'll, I'll first I'll give a point about giving feedback because this is one of the ones that <laughs> it's very frustrating to me because especially because I talk about learning and I talk about feedback, you know, people will say, you know, I've been asking people for feedback and people just say nice things to me. No one wants to give me real feedback. And I'm like, are you really asking for feedback? Are you asking for people to make you feel better? And I'm just telling you, everyone's asking for people to make them feel better. Almost no one is asking for actual feedback. <laughs> And they want encouragement. They want people to say that they're doing a good job. You know, I talked to this researcher, I think his name was Angelo Denisi, and he does a lot of work on feedback in, a, in an sort of industrial psychology, organizational context. And his comment to me when I talked to him was that, you know, managers often mistake employees saying that they want feedback with that they want feedback. They don't want feedback. They want to be told they're doing a good job, right? And so if you tell them something negative, you say, you know what? Yeah, you're not doing that very good with this. It's demotivating. It's discouraging and it doesn't work. So, I mean, it's very nice to talk about, oh, you know, I'm going to go up there and take my punches to the jaw and I'm going to be better for the feedback. But you're lying to yourself when you say that that's what you want because typically you don't. And when people come and ask you and they say that they want the honest feedback, very often they don't either. And this creates a problem because it's very hard to give people feedback when we're all aware of this sort of social reality that we live in. So one of the pieces of advice I have for people who are in this situation is don't ask for people to evaluate your performance. Ask them what you could do to improve. And the reason why is that when you ask someone to evaluate either your performance, like what you did on a particular, you know, project or task or like, you know, how is my accent? Or you're asking them to evaluate you or your skill in general, like, you know, how is my Spanish? How am I as a salesperson? This kind of stuff. You're, you're asking for pain because if you get what you ask for, then you're often going to be demotivated. And if you don't get what you ask for, you're going to feel that maybe they were lying to you or trying to be nice to you. Whereas if you say, what are some things that I could do to improve? You get this sort of evaluating yourself according to a level. You just remove that. And then you just ask for, well, what are things that I could do to change? What are things that I could do to improve? What are things that are not working about what I'm doing? And I could uh, level up my performance. And so I think the more you can shift towards these sort of task-specific 
suggestions, task specific improvements, task specific ways that you know maybe you tried doing it this way this time. Um, the the less likely your ego is going to get involved, and the less likely the other person is going to feel like, oh, I'm offending you by telling you that you're actually not that good at this. <laughs> yeah, it's a key point. I feel for many of us, although we're craving that feedback by not actually shifting the perspective for the person who would be giving the feedback, it can be very challenging for them to rate your whole performance. Like, what yeah. specifically am I looking for here? Is there something in particular that you've been focused on that you're looking to improve in? Because it's very difficult to tell uh, as an outside observer, especially if you're not even in a coaching role, uh, how to actually give the right feedback that would be meaningful to the person asking for it. And I, I want to clarify, this doesn't mean that you should never, ever give people feedback. Like if you have an employee and they are not meeting the company standard and they're going to lose their job if they keep this up, then sugarcoating that and being like, well, you know, could you just try to be a little bit more on time instead of showing up three hours late for work every day? Like that's not a good way of communicating either. Like if there's serious objective consequences to them not doing it, then you giving them something that's going to sting a little bit is maybe necessary if they don't realize that they're jeopardizing their job with how they're behaving. You know, maybe they're not paying attention or something like that. Similarly, I think if you're trying to look for uh, benchmarks or objective performance measures, like your purpose is not just to improve in general, but you really want to know, do you, do you meet a particular standard? Then I try to suggest people look towards metrics that are more objective. So, you know, if you're trying to figure out, you know, what's your selling efficiency or this kind of thing, you look at your closing rate compared to other people in your same office. Or you could look at, you know, how many projects do you finish on time and under budget compared to the other project managers. Or these kinds of objective measures, I think, do kind of distance you a little bit from that evaluative other person specific information. So when I'm trying to find information about like how I'm performing and I want that level, I don't want just directions for improvement, then I try to find some of those benchmarks because sometimes you can have a benchmark and be like, ooh, I'm not performing up to standard here. And no one needs to break that advice to you. You just look at the numbers and you see it. You mentioned sugarcoating it. Some people like the compliment <laughs> sandwich, yeah. trying to protect others from the feedback. But what does the science say around the, the best way to actually give feedback? Well, I mean, as I said, I think the issue here, and I, I mean, the compliment sandwich probably has some roots and some benefits, but I think like any kind of management technique, if it's done very conspicuously, it often has the unintended effect. It's like, okay, now they're going to give me the crap sandwich and I'm just waiting for that crap in the middle. Like that's what people are expecting when you do this kind of technique. And I think that if you are a manager and you're like, you pick up these books and you look through these tactics of these social skills tactics and you apply them very conspicuously, I mean, yeah, of course they're going to backfire because the person knows what you're doing, right? They know that you're using this in a sort of disingenuous way to like, I wanted to give you criticism, but I'm, I'm like using best practices to sandwich it between two like vaguely nice things I'm saying about you. So the research says that the best way to give feedback is again to what we were talking about, focusing on the task and the specific things that the person can do to improve rather than evaluations of them as a person. So one of my favorite meta-analyses on these topics was done by Abraham Kluger and Angelo Denisi, and they found that something like 36% of the studies that they looked at at applying feedback, the impact was actually negative. So in all, like over a third of the cases, giving people more feedback actually made worse outcomes for learning. And when they dug into this research, they found that a lot of the cases where feedback did have this negative role is that it wasn't focused on the task. It wasn't focused on performance. It was focused on evaluating them as a person or evaluating this sort of like this holistic sense. And if you think about it, like again, going back to our skill specificity issue, this idea that like in order to improve, you need to make quite specific adjustments in what you're doing. You can see that, well, the hey, you're not very productive or you're not very smart or you're not very good at this is like very high on the sort of ego threat to ourselves. Like we're more likely to react to it emotionally rather than rationally, but it's very low on the information content. Like there's very little you could do with that information other than maybe like work harder. Like if you just weren't working hard enough, maybe that will give you some kind of prodding of like, oh, I didn't know that I was, you know, doing a bad job here. I'll just try better in general. But if you are already trying your best, it does nothing for you. It's just demotivating. Whereas if you tell someone, hey, you know, when you do this report, can you make sure you put the date on it this time? Because otherwise, you know, we're going to get them lost 
lost in the filing records or, or whatever banal office example I can think of. Now all of a sudden, you're given something very, very concrete and task specific. So I think the best advice that we can have is focus on the task, but then also have genuine empathy for the person. I think that the sandwich technique kind of in a certain way, tries to replicate what people who are genuinely concerned with the emotional well-being of others do naturally, which is that they, you know, talk to them, show that they value them, they give this sort of sign of appreciation. But if those are just boxes you're checking off in your management to-do list, I don't think that it works as well. I'm excited to to share with the audience <laughs> that. <laughs> no, I'm I'm kidding. the The feedback piece, I think, oftentimes we we brace ourselves. And mm -hmm. then if there is a situation where we can't quite make heads or tails, what can we do upon receiving the feedback to, to make it more effective for us if maybe we do have a manager who just gives us that crap sandwich? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, there is an onus on us. I feel like every piece of information we receive, there's a gap between how we receive it and our interpretation of that event. So I think sometimes we just take things for granted of like, well, you know, oh, my boss hates me, right? Because he gave me this bad report. Or, you know, maybe I put it on him and just say, oh, my boss is just sort of a, an unreasonable person and has unreasonable expectations. Or, you know, they don't like me because I'm an X, Y, or Z, or, or whatever. We don't realize that, always when we're making that, we're doing some active interpretation. And so this isn't to say that those interpretations are right or wrong. They might be right. You know, maybe your boss is a misogynist or maybe your boss does have unrealistic standards. But I think recognizing that there is an active component in making that interpretation is very valuable because the question you need to ask yourself, is my interpretation true, but also is it useful to me? Because a, an interpretation of the feedback can be 100% true and 0% useful. And then in which case, like, yeah, you have this true fact in your head, but it's useless to you. You can't do anything with it. So I always bias myself in favor of interpretations that are higher in usefulness. Now, that doesn't mean that you should sacrifice truth, but it means you should look for ways that you could interpret this to make it more useful. So if your boss is a real hothead and they just get really angry about things, how can I approach them with information in a way that they're like less likely to get upset? Like if they're going to get upset about this, how do I recognize, okay, well, don't talk to them at the end of the day on Friday when they're like all stressed out and they're about ready to leave in the weekend. Like go like Tuesday morning when things haven't hit a crisis yet. That's when I'm going to broach them with this kind of thing. And so I think the more you can shape that interpretation of like, well, this is what I need to do. And this is, you know, yes, that colleague, that boss, that teacher, maybe I don't like them, maybe I don't like their style, but this is what I can do to get the most for myself. I mean, that's going to be ultimately what's more productive. Well, thank you for sharing. I think that's so impactful for all of us listening who are growth-minded and, and on the path to mastery. Do you feel or does science feel that once you master a set of skills, it becomes easier then to master other skills? Is there a correlation to mastery? Yeah. Because I think so many of us one, want to master things and or we're potentially starting families or we have kids and we want them to learn that very mm -hmm. important skill of mastery. So again, there's sort of two answers to this. One goes back to this mind not being a muscle analogy here of this toolkit idea. So in this sort of intellectual cognitive way of thinking about it, the amount of transfer you should get should be based on how much they share components. So there are skills that are very generally useful because they overlap with so many things. So I think a lot of basic math is very useful. And it's, I'm sorry if you were like someone who hated math when you were a kid, <laughs> but it is very useful because basically every single quantitative domain uses the same math. So if you learn math really, really well in one domain, you get a lot of transfer because they use math in a lot of other domains. This is why people who do their PhD in physics often go on to Wall Street trading firms. Not because they're doing physics, it's because they're doing math and the math is the same. But that is one sort of perspective of like load up your mind with as many general purpose useful tools as possible and you will be generally smart. But then the other thing is true is that it's not just intellectual, it's also, also emotional. It's also about self-confidence. And so I think, going back to what we were talking about, I don't think mastering one skill will give you a lot of intellectual benefits in a completely unrelated skill, but mastering a skill tells you something about yourself. And that self-knowledge that 
I can stick to goals. I can set targets. I can work hard at things. I can complete projects. That self-knowledge is incredibly valuable because it allows you to take on bigger and more ambitious projects. So I like to think of self-confidence and self-efficacy as a bit of a flywheel that we want to get it starts turning. And it, it's hard to get a flywheel turning in the beginning. It's heavy. It takes a long time till it spins up. But once it's spinning, then you can easily apply that momentum to other projects. So if you're trying to think about your kids, for instance, how do I make them into lifelong learners? Get them to love learning things. Get them to feel like they are confident that they can handle their own learning projects and take on things and give them those positive experiences. Because if you can build that self-efficacy flywheel, then you won't know how far they can go. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all these great maxims and lessons with our audience. Where can they find out about your latest book and the work that you do, Scott? Sure, yeah. You can check out the book, Get Better at Anything, uh, wherever books are sold, Amazon, Audible. You can also check out my previous book, Ultra Learning, which detailed some of my uh, self-directed learning projects, like the language learning one we discussed. And then they can also check out my website at scotthyoung.com. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. 